Hello, welcome one and all to the seventh official episode of Dylan Explains Everything. My name is Dylan, and in case you couldn't tell by the title, I'm the one explaining everything, including today's topic, DNA and its interesting history. I'm going to be running through a lot of facts, so if you're curious as to where I get my information, check the description below for a list of links. DNA, also called deoxyribonucleic acid, is a piece of genetic hereditary material that most organisms, including humans, contain. It's sort of like the Lego instruction manual, only instead of Legos, it's whatever organism it belongs to. DNA is comprised of four nitrogenous bases, adenine represented by an A, guanine represented by a G, cytosine represented by a C, and thymine represented by a T. These four bases are what make up DNA, much like letters make up a word. In this case, it's also on a line of sugar phosphate in a double helix shape in pairs. In this case, A is always paired up with T, and G is always paired up with C. DNA is very small and is inside of cells, mainly in the nucleus and the mitochondria. The nucleus is the center of the cell, and the mitochondria is also called the powerhouse of the cell. When the cell makes another one of itself, it uses the DNA as an instruction manual. When DNA is used to make a cell, it's actually making the proteins with instructions from the pairs. It copies this information onto an RNA, which then acts as a messenger to the ribosomes of the cell. The ribosomes then translate the message into amino acids, which are the building blocks for proteins. And after the amino acids join together through some folding in science, boom, you've got proteins. The DNA doesn't just help replicate cells, it can also replicate itself. It unzips into two strands of the bases, then they get the pairs that they're looking for and create another DNA. This is also when DNA comes into genetics, because the reason that a kid's hair color or skin color might be similar to its parents is because the parent's DNA replicated in order to create the kid. This is also where certain medical problems and mutations can come around. If a kid has a problem with the copying or transmitting from the parent's DNA into a protein, then it might cause the kid to have three chromosomes where there should only be two in their genes. This is also how animals are able to gain some unique abilities. When they're being created, they might have a problem in the copying of their DNA, which gives them some attribute. This might help them to survive or die off. So other than standing here talking about boring science, what did I want to tell you about? Well, I wanted to talk more about the history behind DNA rather than what it actually is. This all started back when humans started selectively breeding animals and crops for better tastes, looks, or other attributes. For example, if they wanted a big dog, they could breed two big dogs and they'd most likely have another one. After many years of having bigger livestock, friendlier dogs, and much more, in ancient Greece, the philosopher Aristotle theorized that when two parent organisms have a kid, they pass some of their genetic characteristics onto that kid. This was backed up more by the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was a monk who worked on pea plants in 1857. He would breed certain plants that had certain phenotypes or physical characteristics and see what kind of phenotypes their kids would have. Gregor Mendel found out a few things about genetic. First of all, he found out that genes are the things that determine your phenotypes or your physical characteristics, and that those genes come in pairs called alleles. These alleles are determined by your parents. Each one of your parents gives you a gene, making two genes. Then, in 1869, Friedrich Miescher, a Swiss scientist, found a substance he called the nucleon. He studied it and even wrote a paper about it in 1871. Then, in 1889, his student, Richard Altman, helped study it and renamed it nucleic acid and linked it to chromosomes, which had been found in 1882. Then, in 1902, scientists Theodore Bovary and Walter Sutton discovered that chromosomes don't only carry genetic information, but their location also affects genetic traits. They continued researching this and other things about hereditary information for years. Then, in 1928, scientist Frederick Griffith found out that DNA was in charge of inheritance. This experiment that he used to discover this involved mice and pneumonia, 
So you should probably check that out because I don't want to explain it. A year later in 1929, a scientist at the Rockefeller Institute named Phoebus Levine found the components of DNA, the four nitric bases, sugar, and phosphate. They also named these and came up with the order of these. Then two decades later in 1949, the scientists Colette and Roger Vendrelli and Andre Boivin found out something else about DNA. They found out it was consistent throughout the cells of a body and throughout the organisms of the same species. Around the same time in the 40s, a scientist named Erwin Chargaff found something out that would be called Chargaff's rule. It was that there's a ratio that's consistent between animals and DNA with the nitric bases. Specifically, he found out that adenine and thymine were equal, as were guanine and cytosine. This is because, as we've already established, they're paired up and therefore there have to be an equal number of them. Then we get to 1952, where one of the most important discoveries about DNA was made. A researcher named Rosalind Franklin was able to isolate a DNA molecule and use an x-ray to take a picture of the shape of it, a repeating double helix, and using this, she was able to calculate everything about the DNA molecule. Two years later, in 1954, the scientists Watson and Crick made a model of the double helix shape and posted it to the public. Now, I could go on and on talking about people's discoveries of DNA, but I want to talk about this one a little more because of something that happened in 1962. What happened in 1962 was the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize for Medicine went to Watson and Crick for their discovery of DNA and its shape. They had gotten the award for not only the shape, but the calculations of the shape, which had been found out by Rosalind Franklin two years prior, though she didn't get a single mention nor a reward for the Nobel Prize. You see, around the time that Watson and Crick were working together, Crick had a friend named Maurice Wilkins. Now, Maurice Wilkins was a co-worker of Rosalind Franklin. He went away on vacation, and when he got back, he found out that Rosalind Franklin was actually doing good work as a scientist. Now, originally, he thought of himself as Rosalind's kind of boss, and her as his assistant. And at the time, women weren't really allowed to be scientists. So when he found out that she was doing better than him, he was a little jealous. See, about a year after Rosalind Franklin discovered the DNA shape, she had to move to a different college. While she was moving, Wilkins somehow got access to her file from the college and took out photo 51, the photo of the DNA shape. He also erased it from her file completely and took it to Watson and Crick. After Wilkins took this to Watson and Crick, they both decided to start making papers about their discovery that they found. They got famous for it and they were able to get a lot of money for it. Meanwhile, Rosalind Franklin was actually being productive, studying virology and making a lot of progress on the study of viruses. Then in 1958, on April 16th, Rosalind Franklin died, supposedly from the research she was doing with x-rays and other types of machines. And then four years later in 1962, Watson Crick won the prize without even a mention of her. Then in 1968, 10 years after Rosalind Franklin's death, Watson wrote a book on his and Crick's discovery that they made all on their own. The book was called Double Helix, and in the book, he portrays Rosalind Franklin as a villain, calling her a belligerent, emotional woman unable to interpret her own data. Now, within the past decade or so, the truth finally came out about Watson and Crick's discovery, and Rosalind Franklin was given the credit she deserves, with multiple research grants, scholarships, and facilities named after her. Now, whether you think this is all interesting or you just think that Watson and Crick were horrible people or both, you have to admit that the scientists mentioned discoveries helped influence us in medicine and helped teach us multiple things to this day. With all that being said, if you enjoyed today's video, why not click the subscribe button to see more like it and click the like button to let me know you did like it. If you have a suggestion for a Dylan Explains Everything, leave it in the comments below. And until we meet again, my name's Dylan and I explain everything. And we can talk about it. So what do you think?